Chapter 8. Does the body cause the soul to sin? Quite true, say they, yet the flesh is a sinner, so much so that it forces the soul to sin along with it, and thus they vainly accuse it and lay to its charge alone the sins of both. But in what instance can the flesh possibly sin by itself, if it have not the soul going before it and inciting it? For as in the case of a yoke of oxen, if one or other is loosed from the yoke, neither of them can plow alone. So neither can soul or body alone affect anything, if they be unyoked from their communion. And if it is the flesh that is the sinner, then on its account alone did the Savior come, as he says, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Since then the flesh has been proved to be valuable in the sight of God and glorious above all his works, it would very justly be saved by him. We must meet, therefore, those who say that even though it be the special handiwork of God and beyond all else valued by him, it would not immediately follow that it has the promise of the resurrection. Yet is it not absurd that that which has been produced with such circumstance, and which is beyond all else valuable, should be so neglected by its maker as to pass to non-entity? Then the sculptor and painter, if they wish the works they have made to endure, that they may win glory by them, renew them when they begin to decay. But God would so neglect his own possession and work that it becomes annihilated and no longer exists. Should we not call this labor in vain? As if a man who has built a house should forthwith destroy it or should neglect it, though he sees it falling into decay and is able to repair it. We would blame him for laboring in vain. And should we not so blame God? But not such one is the incorruptible. Not senseless is the intelligence of the universe. Let the unbelieving be silent, even though they themselves do not believe. But in truth, he has even called the flesh to the resurrection and promises to it everlasting life. For where he promises to save man, there he gives the promise to the flesh. For what is man but the reasonable animal composed of body and soul? Is the soul by itself man? No, but the soul of man. Would the body be called man? No, but it is called the body of man. If then neither of these is by itself man, but that which is made up of the two together is called man, and God has called man to life and resurrection, he has called not a part, but the whole, which is the soul and the body. Since would it not be unquestionably absurd if, while these two are in the same being and according to the same law, the one were saved and the other were not? And if it be not impossible, as has already been proved, that the flesh be regenerated, what is the distinction on the ground of which the soul is saved and the body not? Do they make God a grudging God? But he is good and will have all to be saved. And by God and his proclamation, not only has your soul heard and believed on Jesus Christ and with it the flesh, but both were washed and both wrought righteousness. They make God then ungrateful and unjust if, while both believe on him, he desires to save one and not the other. Well, they say, but the soul is incorruptible, being a part of God and inspired by him, and therefore he desires to save what is peculiarly his own and akin to himself, but the flesh is incorruptible and not from him as the soul is. Then what thanks are due to him, and what manifestation of his power and goodness is it, if he proposed to save what is by nature saved and exists as part of himself. For it had its salvation from itself, so that in saving the soul, God does no great thing. For to be saved is its natural destiny because it is part of himself, being his inspiration. But no thanks are due to one who saves what is his own, for this is to save himself. For he who saves a part himself saves himself by his own means, lest he become defective in that part. And this is not the act of a good man. For not even when a man does good to his children and offspring does one call him a good man, 
for even the most savage of the wild beasts do so, and indeed willingly endure death, if need be, for the sake of their cubs. But if a man were to perform the same acts in behalf of his slaves, that man would justly be called good. Wherefore the Savior also taught us to love our enemies, since, says he, what thank have ye? So that he has shown us that it is a good work not only to love those that are begotten of him, but also those that are without. And what he enjoins upon us, he himself first of all does.